Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP, this is Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you those extra nuggets and tidbits to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. And there is, as ever, lots to talk about. I'm going to first draw your attention to an article I have written for Only Sky. It's the Kokovka Dam, how we know the Russians were to blame. Where I just go into all the stuff I've already talked about, uh, as, you know, compiling, accumulating all the evidence, you know, evidence for self-destruction, evidence for that the Russians did it, um, so on and so forth. So it, it's all there for you. Uh, it's a kind of one-stop shop for, you know, the the evidence we have that the Russians destroyed the dam and were responsible. The only warning I give you, trigger warning, if you are a massive fan of Tucker Carlson, uh, just close your eyes over uh, one or two paragraphs because I'm, I'm not particularly kind about him. Because he is, of course, blaming it on the Ukrainians and it is just absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, that is uh, that is my piece for Only Sky. Go and check that out. I, it's actually, it was supposed to be a piece on how the dam should be a red line, uh, much the in much the same way a nuclear strike would be like a um, tactical nuke. Uh, there should be the same response to the dam being destroyed as a tactical nuke being used. However, first of all, I had to lay out who was responsible and ha how it happened before then talking about how how bad it was and, and why it was why the ramifications are so bad and why it's equivalent to a kind of tactical nuke being used uh, and talking about how you know the international condemnation was kind of a bit empty uh, and actually it should have been as strong as it would have been had it been a, a, a tactical nuke used so that second part will come. I'll write that. I was writing this and I was like almost finished it. And Prigozhin then went and did his mutiny. I was like, this is going to be irrelevant, this this article. No one's really going to, this could be the end of the war. Russia could crumble. And I was like, I'll write it anyway. And then as it happened, Prigozhin did a 360 turnaround and the mutiny never really took hold but uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing but I was wondering you know whether I should continue writing the article anyway it's there for your delectation right talking of Prigozhin and the mutiny and I've mentioned Wargonzo here Simon Pegzov is it he potentially is dead although it's unconfirmed still his Wargonzo telegram channel is still posting but usually there are teams of people unlike me where i'm on my on my todd working my socks off trying to get all this stuff uh actually no i've jr thank you for helping me with my mapping you're a legend and all of you guys who support just in general uh but here wargonzo is talking to Prigozhin, and this is quite a conversation and this obviously happened before, you know, some weeks back. In fact, I, I remember this. I don't know if this is maybe a month or so uh, ago. I'll read out the subtitles for those who are listening. So you've got war guns are saying, you're not being given more ammo because you might turn your guns on Moscow, storm the Kremlin. I mean, this is incredibly prescient. He says, these kind of concerns, how unfounded are they? Prigozhin looks at him over his glasses. What, whether we'll march on to Moscow. Wargonzo replies, well, their justification is that Wagner PNC have reached a certain autonomy. Uh, Prigozhin has certain political ambitions. He can take his private army, turn it around and usurp power in Russia, uh, says Wargonzo. Uh, Prigozhin replies, about marching to Moscow, it's an interesting thought, but uh, we haven't thought about it. Uh, maybe this was the first time he did think about it. Maybe he's like, oh, Wargonzo, that's a pretty good idea. Thanks for that. Uh, and then Wargonzo replies at the end of this clip anyway. I wasn't suggesting you do. Uh, you don't have to think about it. Turns out he did think about it. Wargonzo is all your fault. So uh, it's incredible. You know, you don't... And one of the theories as to Prigozhin and Wagner having a shell hunger, moaning about not having enough ammunition, is that they were actually stockpiling the ammunition they were getting and therefore didn't for this mutiny and therefore didn't have enough ammunition to conduct their normal uh, offensives on the front line. So he's saying, oh, we need more, we need more. Well, actually, you, you've had your fair share. You're just arguably stockpiling it. So I think that's a really, really, uh, 
I don't know. I, it's almost amusing in how prescient it is. It's like, oh my goodness. Now, to continue with this subject matter, Michael Weiss, the journalist for Yahoo News, says they haven't disarmed. They're still recruiting. So this is talking about Wagner PMC, who apparently should be either being assimilated into the Russian MOD or disarming, disbanding, so on and so forth. Their, their bosses were so they're still recruiting. Their bosses' whereabouts are unknown, and how the MOD is going to incorporate any of them into the military is well, get your popcorn and wait and see. And he then posts Dmitry from War Translated saying more people joining the slander of Wagner fighter bomber says the Wagners are humiliating the Russian army from day one, beatings, robbing, etc. So fighter bomber is a is a really pro Russian uh, Telegram channel, a really actually a source that's quite often used. I will say things that originally have come from fighter bomber. Uh, we'll come on to talk about this idea of slander of Wagner in a, in a second. Dimitri continues, all things considered, good outcome. The more they argue, the better. Absolutely. So let's read this post. Only total, remember, this is coming from pro-Russian ultra-nationalist sort of source. Only total morons would think that the army, which was slagged off and mocked by Wagner's, not only in the media, but also throughout the duration of the special military operation, would support Prigozhin. Particularly surprising were statements about the pain of ordinary Russian soldiers, whom the PMC shot in the Keens, don't know quite what that means, whether that's a mistranslation, robbed uh, and beat them from almost the first day of the special military operation, taking advantage of their inviolable status. But if you're allowed to be robbed and beaten and you endure it with a weapon in your hands without trying to stand up for yourself in front of the bandits, then there's no use of you as a warrior. A person who, with a weapon in his hands, cannot defend himself, cannot defend the country. And now the army will be beating Wagner, Wagner with a heavy heart, slowly and painfully, but not in the name of Shoigu and even Putin. But for the fact that on the 24th of June, the Wagner heroes, the defenders of Russia, the combat brothers, the most worthy of the worthy, suddenly became ordinary traitor mercenaries who decided in the most difficult time for the country to show that they are in power here and no doubt ready to kill everyone who gets in their way, which they did. It is a pity that they did not have time to F up those who gave birth to them and gave them the status of untouchables. So you can see that this is someone who is really angry, really angry with Wagner and is venting their spleen concerning them uh, on the socials. Well, Chris O'Wiki here talks about how the Russian authorities appear to be regretting recently passing a law that makes criticism of the Wagner group a criminal offence. Uh, thousands of Russians, likely including Vladimir Putin himself, are now theoretically subject to criminal charges, attracting years in jail. Here's the thing, this is a complete sidebar not to do with this at all. You know, the other day I spoke to you about how uh, there are many different faces of Putin, how there really is some good evidence of body doubles in, in terms of what he looks like. And then that thing came out yesterday where someone clocked that Putin did two things at once in the public sphere that were recorded and you're like well there's definitely a body double going on then i watched the end of litvinenko which is an itv uh, uk production a uh, dramatization of sasha alexander litvinenko being murdered in london in 2006 by polonium Polonium 210, and that's only made in Russia, and it's only basically available by, you know, by the Russian state. But therefore, the Russian state did it. Putin did it, and they actually showed some 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 archive footage on the dramatization at the end of Putin saying something in 2006. Um, and I was like, that's a that's a different man. That is not the man. The footage they showed of him I was like, there's no way that face is the Putin's face that I see today. It's just, it's just like it can't be. It's not, and I know there's like Botox, steroids, all these kind of theories about why he's got a puffier face and all this. Uh, he's not well. He's not steroids. Yada yada yada. But I'm like, it's definitely not the same person. And I, I hate conspiracy theories. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the evidence is 
seemingly much more widespread that he he, he does has is using body doubles uh, or or even more than body doubles i think like speaking doubles i don't i don't know anyway uh, that's a bit of a sidebar Going back to Wagner, so let me read this again. The Russian authorities appear to be regretting recently passing a law that makes criticism of Wagner Group a criminal offence. Thousands of Russians, likely including Putin himself, are now theoretically subject to criminal charges attracting years in jail. In January, in January 2023, Evgeny Prigozhin began lobbying for criticism of Wagner to be criminalised under the same article as the existing offence of discrediting the Russian armed forces, which has been used to suppress criticism of the war in Ukraine. And then he refers back to a January the, January the 25th thread that he did. Uh, Speaker of the Russian Parliament, uh, Vyacheslav uh, Volodin, introduced new legislation to allow prosecutions for fakes and discrediting volunteer formations, organisations or persons assisting in the performance of tasks assigned to the armed forces of the Russian Federation. It increased punishments from three to five years imprisonment for fake information and from five to seven years for discrediting. The offences are increased to medium gravity, roughly equivalent to an upgrade from misdemeanor to a felony. As the state Duma is effectively a Putin-controlled brother stamp, the new legislation was duly passed in March. But there's just one problem. Wagner are now officially regarded as bad guys, as State Duma Deputy Chairman Vladislav Davankov has pointed out. Quote, if left unchanged, the norms of the law, thousands of Russians, so, so that's what he means uh, by if left unchanged, if left unchanged, thousands of Russians could be jailed for 15 years for expressing a civil position on the actions of the PNC leadership after Saturday's events. Would that be reasonable and fair? Of course not. There should be a moratorium on prosecuting under this article, at least for public opinions about the actions of PMCs and the armed forces outside the combat zone. This is where you get into ridiculous situations. Of course, if you're legislating against, I mean, this is censorship of the very worst sort, right? If you can't give criticism, like just decent, robust criticism of, a, of an organization, of a group of people, you know, particularly like people who that include like convicts uh, and people doing terrible things, like sledgehammering people to death. If you can't criticize that legally, then what kind of society are you living in? Uh, there, there's a place, there's a time and place for like moderation, as I've talked before, say on Twitter or whatever public space you're talking about. But if you are invalidating humans, this is why I'm. A, this is where I'm a definitely I am a free speech advocate. If you are invalidating people from criticizing uh, institutions, people, ideas uh, in robust ways, then you are you have a, you have a real problem. This is why I think blasphemy laws are absolutely terrible because you're ring fencing an entire religion from being criticized. I mean, that's a whole different kettle of fish, right? But they're super important. You need to be able to criticize these ideas. I mean, I do it from a philosophical point of view. All right, if I'm not allowed, if there's ideas I can't challenge in the world, in my own little space on the internet, right, because the laws of my country disallow me to do that, then, hey, we, we have a bit of a problem. Moving on, I have been wondering about this for ages, and I'm so glad I've found some of this machine. Right, so this is a Russian BN BTM-3 trench digging machine in action. BTM-3s were first built in 1957. Uh, I'm, it's not so interesting that this is an old piece of kit. I have been wondering how the hell they are building trenches this quickly. I don't get how the Russians particularly can build trenches at the speed they do. Like by hand, by diggers, I don't see that many like excavators like marching around the front lines digging up stuff. Yes, one was hit in Kursk. This seeing something like this, I'm like, now it makes sense. You can absolutely churn through the fields. Uh, just yeah, right, okay. When you've got machines like this, building trenches becomes somewhat more um, efficient. You know. Uh, a little bit easier this is designed to build trenches of exactly the right size uh, and you can imagine that 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 thing can probably build a trench right across a field in uh in, in a couple of hours maybe i mean that's a slow walk across a field and dumping the earth e either side i mean that's that's a fantastic bit of machinery so that is how, at least in some places, I don't know how many of these they've got and whether there are other versions of these, but that is how they are building trenches. Um, yeah, 
So that is a BTM3 trench digging machine. And that is some pretty uh, pretty cool technology for 1957. I like that. I mean, it's simple, isn't it? Dig a hole, spit out the dirt either side. Uh, it needs to be this wide. Job done. Right. Okay, moving on to the next thing. Uh, today's random assortment. We're going to go on to good old Margarita Simonia, the chief propagandist, uh, one of the top dogs of the RT network, Russia Today. Quote, now they are discussing a lot. They opened a criminal case and then they released him. He left for Belarus. This is a mockery of legal norms. Legal norms are not the commandments of Christ or the tablets of Moses, said Simonian. They are written by people to protect the rule of law and stability in the country. And if in some exceptional critical cases, it turns out that they cease to perform their function and perform the opposite, then they go to the forest. I always find it interesting when Russia being a former Soviet uh, country, the former Soviet Union with state atheism, and I say this as a, as a non-religious secular philosopher, but I, I find it fascinating that it moves to have embraced religion so overtly for its own ends, Putin does particularly. And here you've got you know, Simone Yen with her, her crucifix making reference to religion uh, quite a bit, and you see this a lot. I wrote an article on this recently uh, and did a whole video. I did a whole video was it on my other channel to do with how Russia is utilizing religion to their own ends. It's no, nothing to do with like the truth and falsity of religion or whatever, but just how it has become a tool for Putin since for, for quite some time actually, since like 2007, I think, like uh, early doors, he was he was he's been using religion for quite a long time to get that kind of conformity to rubber stamp a load of social laws and um moves to get that kind of us and them in society and get people aligned to his his viewpoints he's really utilized uh, religion effectively and you've seen a lot of propagandists jump on board uh, with religious rhetoric uh, and this being a war that is effectively some kind of crusade some kind of religious war and what she means by this, as Anton Garashenko says, is Russian propaganda Simonian and explains that laws in Russia can be changed if the situation requires it, meaning the situation with Prigozhin. And again, it goes back to like, hey, we made some laws whereby it's illegal to criticize Wagner PMC. Dang, uh, we all hate Wagner PMC now. Let's just change the laws. Uh, how convenient. And uh, yeah, it's the bending of the laws because, hey, they're not tablets. Uh, that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai type thing. Uh, so, hey, we can change these laws if we see fit. Anyway, I uh, just saw as an interesting bit of uh, opinion from our favourite propagandist. Right. Uh, speaking of, you know, disagreeing with me on religion, here here is a great comment. I love it. Love this. Uh, thanks so much, John. So, uh, John here says, Hi, Jonathan. I'm well aware of your views regarding religion and we on that matter. Uh, fundamentally disagree. I am happy to agree to disagree. Nevertheless, I wholeheartedly approve of your work on Ukraine. Not that you are in any shape or form, you know, need my approval. This comment is in regard to the attitude of chains of command and the information they receive and whether it is accurate or not. I gave you that uh, that preamble because he says, I once served as an RAF chaplain during Operation Desert Fox from 1980, uh, 1998 to 1999, based in Saudi Arabia. So he it was uh, a you know religious chaplain for the RAF. Now, this was in regard to something I was saying about Vranio, about BS being passed up the chain of command, right? And then you doing stuff that you know it's all BS, and then those kind of reports go up and up and up, and then at some point, someone's just got a, a, a mass of BS, and then they kind of actually think it's true and make decisions on the basis of that being true. But actually, everyone knows it's loaded bunker. He says, and, and I love these kind of anecdotes throwing in like real world uh, examples. So we were a recce unit consisting of three Tornado GL1As. So these are UK fighter bombers uh, in the RAF, supported by massive American presence uh, to support our mission critical role of Battle Damage Assessment, BDA. A new detachment commander took over 
from one who was popular and he, to say the least, was not. What was worse though was the under-equipping of the detachment, which meant that our lads had to go cap, cap, cap in hand to the Americans to beg equipment that they had thrown on their scrap heap. Often it just took a little tweak from an engineer and the kit was made to work again. Testament to the US extravagant throwaway rather than mend culture. I just uh, I've given you this anecdote before, but my friend who's a tank commander said that the Americans have so much equipment. I mean, I know you get some of the fringe people, you know, worrying how much equipment the Americans are giving to to Ukraine. But they have a lot of equipment. And in fact, they have so much equipment that, that my friend was telling me that after one of the engagements in Iraq, they it was just too much effort, expense or whatever to take, literally, it would be things like Bradley's tanks, whatever it was, to take this equipment back to, to the US. So they buried a bunch in the deserts in in Iraq. They're like, oh, yeah, we're just going to bury all this equipment because we're, we're not going to be bothered to take it back. I mean, that's like the British are really like, uh, we've only got four of these, so uh, they're coming back with us. <laughs> in fact, they're more likely to bury us out here than them, than that. But there you go. So uh, he goes on to say, we would trade the US chaps their kit for decent meals in our excellent all ranks mess. We were known by the Yanks as the borrowers. Time came for the Defence Secretary George Robertson, known colloquially as the Fat City, to make a visit. The visit was so stage managed and scripted, it was unbelievable. Only certain safe members of the detachment were allowed to see and speak with him, extremely vetted, and others were, including myself, prohibited. Robertson flew in, stayed a very few short hours, and then flew off to a nice hotel. He did not learn the truth of our deficiencies, including the struggle to keep our worn-out GR1As operational. In contrast, an equivalent figure, to his absolute credit, came around New Year's 98-99 to to visit the US detachment. He insisted on total freedom of access. No minders uh, to sleep in the same tents and eat the same food as the USAF chaps and stayed for a more extended period of time than three hours. Sadly, the BS reporting scenario is endemic in the UK armed forces as well as Russia. This nonsense of false reporting is a military, military reality and sadly affects the UK as well as Russia. Wow. So, I, I, you know, I found that really, uh, really an interesting read. And this is why I, you know, I love the community of commenters here at ATP Geopolitics. It brings so much wealth of knowledge and experience uh, to the conversation. Now, speaking of which, here is the truth answering uh, or adding to claims that were made in a video where I was talking about the Russian economic situation and, and then being on, on a bit of a precipice, on the edge of a precipice at the moment. And this is a truth saying this. So thank you, The Truth, first of all. A brilliant comment. Although, as ever, this is uh, some random guy commenting. So take everything he says with a pinch of salt or some healthy skepticism. You know, I, I can't verify everything that's being said here, but it, it seems really kosher. So, OK, let's start with the oil. The, the payback is for refineries and for oil producers, although there are sometimes the same group of companies. So this is to say that there's talk about how tax revenues have gone down and expenses have gone up and they're paying out, the Russian government are paying out these uh, effectively payback subsidies type things to to oil field, fields to keep them uh, running. Um, so the oil fee fields keep pumping regardless. This is something the piece you read out had wrong. Russia is actually exporting more oil than last year. Their issue is it is the unprocessed crude. This is why the refineries need financial support. So he's saying it's the refineries are getting those kickbacks. Um, at they are uh, they are not being put to work. So despite the high production, Russia is just not making money on its oil. So what is happening here is absolutely right. So unprocessed, like crude oil is going out to places like India and India then refine the crude oil because it keeps them, it, it keeps their workforce employed, right? It's, rather than receiving more expensive refined oil from Russia, and then you just use that, you get the crude oil and you need the natural resource, but actually we're going to employ our people to more cheaply refine it and also gives them all jobs. So you're then buying crude oil at a much lower price without that added value and then being a much lower price, actually 
the Russians aren't making that much money on it. So he goes on to say, so despite the high production, Russia is just not making money on its oil. The price cap and European ban have worked exactly as planned. Now let's talk about borrowing. The Russian state is about to go on a borrowing spree. How do I know this? The finance minister said so. At the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, he has been shouting at the leaders of the top Russian banks to buy government bonds. He even complained that they wanted more than 10% annual interest. This is something that the trolls don't mention when talking about how Western countries have higher debt per GDP. Debt is never a problem. It is the interest that kills you. Anyone with a variable mortgage can tell you that after the, the last year. Uh, the more that, sorry, the other and more interesting indicator is the fact Russia is removing interest payments from their budget. Russian bonds tend to be short and follow the interest rate. It makes hiding national debt tricky as it is simple mass to figure out. Taking interest payments out of the budget hides this and as a kick it, it will help balance the books. Of course, on paper, not declaring your liabilities doesn't make them go away. Now for the budget, this is relatively transparent in its absolute numbers, if not the details. So how can they hide that they are now overspending more than they have declared? They have a simple way of doing this. They have actually started spending next year's budget this year. It comes off next year's expenditure and not this year. At the, this rate, the January 2024 figures are going to be very interesting. If I had to guess, I would say they didn't this last year also, which is why the budget is so bad at the start of this year. Now for the ruble, everyone knows the rate of the dollar exchange, but have a Google of the last year of ruble to yuan. Uh, you will see something strange. It was flat for a long time and then a sudden drop and then flat again. What does this tell you? The drop is the inability to support the currency at its previous level. It was costing Russia billions to do this last year. Remember the trolls claiming the ruble was so strong? The fact Russia can no longer do this is telling. Now for overseas investment, they have been cutting back on this big time. South Ossetia is being left high and dry to support its economy. So like South Ossetia is in Georgia. It's like a bit like Transnistria. It's this annexed area of, of uh, Georgia. Bangladesh were having a nuclear power plant built by Russia, and Russia has stopped paying local contractors as they can't afford it. There are so many little signs popping up now that a few months ago were not there. Russia will be in incredible trouble by the end of the year. So much so, I think even scared... Uh, sorry, sacred Crimea, will lose its value to Russia soon and they would be willing to give it up to get sanctions lifted. I will end on this. When the war started, everyone questioned if Ukraine would survive. Now the question is, can Russia survive? It has only been a year and a half. Imagine the picture in another 12 months. Putin cannot have a long war. Russia will not survive it. This is a really good point. And I've been wondering about this for some time, just thinking Russia cannot economically survive like they cannot be in a, in, in a, even a remotely good state it's not not about them being in a good state they, they cannot not be in an absolutely disastrous state uh, as we talked about their their income has been slashed all the sanctions means they can't get stuff uh, there's no doubt that the russian population are either not getting paid a lot don't have a lot of disposable income or are going to be very cautious with their their income they're not going to be like oh yeah you know things are looking good i'm going to just splash out all my money people are going to be like holy crap we're in the middle of war we're being sanctioned everything's going down a pan i'm gonna i'm probably gonna take my money out of the banks and hide it under my floorboards you know that is that is a situation that the population would be in i mean I'm, i always think well, what would i what would i do if i was in that situation if i was a, a russian uh, member of the russian public and so you got those situations. You got obviously the, sac the the oil caps and and caps on other substances and whatnot. Uh, you've got the the labour force having run away to other countries, maybe over a million men uh, emigrating, uh, trying to escape, you know, draft dodging, trying to escape being mobilised or being against the war. And then you've got people being sent to the war and dying and being taken out of the workforce. You've got people in the workforce claiming that that they're working more than they were because particularly in the defense sector having to having to work crazy shifts but you're really not getting paid more for doing so their their pay is not not shifted at all uh, and in some cases they actually have to pay back some of their income to raise funds for the army and and so on and so forth it, it's all looking bad there there's absolutely 
no way Russia can balance the books going forward. Yeah, there's going to be, surely there's going to be a massive economic implosion. So what the truth says here, I can absolutely see making full sense. I mean, there's nothing I would disagree with there. And uh, yeah, it's a good account of, of where Russia stands economically speaking. Right, now for a little bit on, I guess, misinformation. Disinform no, it's probably misinformation. Tom Nichols here says, and he's not the only one. So I've seen this being said about this source, and I've used Eagle Shushko, Shushko a couple of times. So people need to stop following that Shushko account and relying on it for information. This is why. This is Prigozhin capturing Voronezh 45 nuclear storage facility, says Shushko, in Russia, may be part of the key to the lock that can help explain this, his decision to suddenly and bizarrely end the coup, which was succeeding spectacularly. I've been trying to figure out how Prigozhin can guarantee his own. And blah 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 and lots of people called him out on this saying you know this there's no evidence of anything like this happening of Bogosian capturing a nuclear storage facility etc etc uh, and as Pavel Podvig says it's not even the Voronezh 45 storage facility in the image uh, this is what happens when Twitter sells blue check marks to all kinds of randos and actually this leads me on to something else that I have said before in, indeed I've written an article on this now again this is going to be me having go at Elon Musk Blah blah blah, but actually, this is go. You can forget about Elon Musk. Just Twitter in general, right? And it's a huge information source. Twitter now for a journalist. I am a journalist. Technically, I am a journalist. Like I write for Only Sky. Uh, and what, as a journalist, what you do when you go onto Twitter is you you look for verifiable sources. Uh, and it's the same with the, the stuff I do for uh, my ATP Geopolitics channel, right? I look for sources that I think are verifiable and decent uh, and accurate, and then and use them. The blue tick used to be a verifiable mark for someone being who they claim they are. It is not that anymore. It is Elon Musk getting $8.99 a month. You buy a blue chip tick and you get to, to A, get pumped up the uh, like algorithm so your message gets out there more. You're basically paying to be amplified. You're paying to get longer tweets and you're paying... Uh, to have lots of other bits of coding support you. So, for example, you're more likely to be able to have do things like private messaging for people who are unknown. Blah blah blah. All these other, all these kind of little bits and pieces. But what the blue tick doesn't give you is any idea of that human being being reliable, verifiable, who they say they are, anything like that. So, you know, someone could start up a Twitter account with your name. Uh, and you might be all with my main name and pretend to be me and they're not me and they go and buy a blue tick mark and it looks like they're all kosher and they are not. It, it tells you nothing and it actually gives you that amplification. Now, lots of people have been commenting on there are more people who are pro-Russian. If you go down all the kind of uh, the Russian shills on Twitter and look at them, there's a much greater preponderance of blue ticks. So they, because they, they know they they gonna they're happy to pay, uh, you know, Prigozhin's troll farm money for blue ticks that get their voice amplified. And this is like, oh, freedom of speech is not freedom of speech. You pay money, you get your speech out there. It's it's like it's it's some people are a lot freer than others, right? You pay for your message to be thrown out more, and if that if that message is more likely to be a pro-Russian narrative, that means that Twitter is actually doing a service to the, the disinformation community in Russia and the troll farms. Now, here's an example of a pro-Ukrainian spreading stuff that is, that is often, the complaints are from many, that is more often than not, you know, just complete fanciful stuff. Uh, and it's a problem again. You know, you don't, you, it's, it's bad having inaccurate information, no matter which side it is from. Uh, anyway, that's that's my rant about the blue ticks. It makes no sense other than for just a purely, I'd say mercenary, that's a wrong term here, but from a purely financial point of view, it's like, well, we're not getting uh, advertising revenue like we used to because we screwed on moderation, so the advertisers don't want to be here. So how do we make up that money? Well, we charge people $8.99, and then we promise them that we'll throw their, their voices out even more uh, when, that, when they pay us. Okay.
So for those interested in my writing on this, I wrote how the Twitter blue checkmark debacle or debacle went from hilarious to horrifying, and then the blue checkmark debacle rears its ugly head again. You can read those. I'll, I'll link them in the description below. That's my usual kind of have a go at Elon Musk Twitter, and I'm sorry if you love him. Uh, my bad. Or, or maybe not. Anyway, thank you so much for, for listening, for watching. Really appreciate your support. It means an awful lot. Thank you so much to people on Buy Me A Coffee. Very, very generous. I'll read out some names tomorrow for that. And thank you to my members. It means a lot that you are supportive of this, this whole thing. Take care and I'll speak to you tomorrow.